Welcome to the first, the second keynote session of BMES. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce our next plenary session speaker, Mr. Fred Gray. Mr. Gray began his legal career as a sole practitioner. Less than a year out of law school at the age of 24, he represented Mrs. Rosa Parks, who refused to give up her seat to a white man on a city bus. This action initiated the Montgomery bus boycott. Mr. Gray was also Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s first civil rights lawyer. This was the beginning of a legal career that now spans over 50 years. Mr. Gray has been at the forefront of changing the social fabric of America regarding desegregation, integration, and constitutional law, housing, and ethics, and generally in improving the national judicial system. Gray also fought for African American rights to education, the freedom to march peacefully, and the right to participate in juries and opposed injustices with the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study that purposely left affected black men untreated. In 1932, the United States government solicited rural black males in and around Macon County, Alabama to become involved in what has become known as the Tuskegee syphilis study. The study was charged to review untreated syphilis in rural um, African-American male subjects who thought they were be receiving free health care. Gray filed the case, Pollard versus US Public Health Service in 1972, after a whistleblower reported the abuses. The case was settled and the government was ordered to discontinue its treatment program. The US Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee is cited as arguably the most infamous biomedical research study in US history and led to the 1979 Belmont Report and to the establishment for, of the Office for Human Research Protection. With Mr. Gray's encouragement on May 16, 1997, President Bill Clinton formally apologized on behalf of the United States to victims of the study. Throughout his career, he has received numerous awards and honors. In 1985, he served as president of the National Bar Association, and in 1996, he received the Spirit of Excellence Award from the American Bar Association. In 2002, he became the first African-American president of the Alabama Bar Association. Mr. Gray has written two books, Bus Ride to Justice, Changing the System by the System, The Life and Works of Fred Gray, and the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, an insider's account of the shocking medical experiment conducted by government doctors against African-American men. I encourage you to read them. The in 1997, Gray founded and subsequently served as president and board member of the Tuskegee History Center. This nonprofit corporation operates a museum and offers educational resources concerning the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, as well as contributions made by various ethnic groups in the fields of human and civil rights. We encourage you to support the center by making a personal donation. Additionally, all proceeds from the sale of his books go directly to support the center. With that, I welcome Mr. Gray. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. I appreciate uh, those remarks. Let me thank you, uh, the executive director, as Charity Quick and her staff for making all the arrangements for uh, me to be your speaker this morning. And I wanna thank all those persons who are members of the Barometrical Engineering Society for inviting me to share your annual meeting today. I also want to thank my friend uh, Jerry Collins, who I'll talk a little bit about a little later, and want to express to my wife, Carol, and we are second marriage. Uh, she usually travels with me when I go on these trips, and she helped me. And I want to thank my stepdaughter, June Poe, for serving as technical director. Said that, uh, I'm invited to make uh, quite a few speeches. However, I'm very seldom invited a second time to speak at an organization's annual meeting. Your organization is an exception. I spoke at your annual meeting in Atlanta on October 26, 2012. My friend Jerry Collins was responsible for me being invited to that meeting. However, 
Jerry was not responsible for this invitation, though he played a major role in my accepting it. Your executive director contacted Jerry and told him that the organization would like to invite Fred Gray to speak at your annual meeting on the subject health care disparities and racial inequality, injustice. She did not know me personally and asked Jerry's assistance. He gave it, so I'm here. Thank you for the invitation, and Jerry, thank you for what you've done. When I spoke at your annual meeting in, 2000, in 2012, some eight years ago, I participated in a panel discussion on the subject of Affordable Care Act implementation on the African American community. And Dr. Jerry Collins moderated that panel. In my presentation, I stated that the act was the first legislation passed by President Barack Obama. The first such legislation passed by Congress in many years. It provided health care for thousands of people who did not have medical care. Unfortunately, it is now being threatened, that act is. Rinda Marina writes in a recent issue of the American Bar Association Human Rights Magazine in volume 45 on number four about that threat. And I thought I would share it with you because I think it's important. And this is what she said. Two upcoming votes may decide the future of ACA, that's the Affordable Care Act, and the availability and affordability of health care in the United States. The first is the November 2020 election, where attitudes taught the ACA may influence voters' choice, especially in light of their experiences with COVID-19 academic and the movement to eradicate structural racism. The second vote belongs to the U.S. Supreme Court in two cases consolidated under the name California versus Texas. It just so happened that the United States Senate now is having a hearing on the current nominee to that court who may play a major role in whether that act will survive or whether it will be declared unconstitutional. These cases ask whether the tax cuts and the Job Act publications 115-97, December the 27th, 2017, which zeroed out the tax for failure to have minimum health insurance coverage, renders the ACA's individual mandate unconstitutional, and if so, whether the entire ACA Act must fail. Our future health care system depends on both votes. The Supreme Court may impose boundaries on the enterprise of government power but the voters will decide whether the government takes any responsibility for the health of its people. This is one of the reasons this election in a few weeks is so important. 
Your title here today, Healthcare Disparities and Retail Injustice and Racial Injustice, is a follow-up to what I talked with you about in 2012 and an update I have just given you on the Affordable Care Act. I will discuss basically concerns African Americans but it includes all who do not have health care because there is a great disparity in health and a great, this great bill of it is based on race. It also strikes a chord with me for two reasons. Number one, I have spent almost all of my adult life in the legal profession. As Deborah talked about some of those cases, for over 66 years, and on December 14th, I will be 90, fighting for civil rights for African Americans. As she mentioned to you, some of those protecting the rights of city transportation, representing Mrs. Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King and others in the Montgomery bus boycott when I was only 25 years of age. Then, a few years later, in protecting the rights to vote, as people marched, demonstrating the importance of that march, of that vote from Selma to Montgomery, including representing the late Congressman John Lewis and others. And if time permits later on, we may speak a little bit more about Congressman Lewis and how and why we should get involved in good trouble, as the Congressman would call it. Then we filed suits obtaining the rights to equal educational opportunity from kindergarten through graduate school, including suits that desegregated the University of Alabama, Auburn University, and the University of North Alabama. And she mentioned about representing the men in the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, where under the disguise of health care, these men were taken advantage of and denied their constitutional rights. And I will talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So then, the second reason this topic is so important to me personally is because the pres President Clinton made an apology to the men in the Tuskegee syphilis study. He acknowledged not only a disparity in their health care, or lack of it, the study, in the study, but he stated and he said to those men, he made an apology to them in the East Room of the White House on May the 16th, 1997. I think it's important as you talk about inequality to listen to what the then President of the United States had to say about what the government had done to these African American men. This is what he said. The United States government did something that was wrong, deeply, profoundly, morally wrong. It was an outrage to our commitment to integrity and equality of all of our citizens. He then began to talk and apologize to certain segments. He said, to the survivors, to the wives and the family members, the children and the grandchildren, I say what you know, no power on earth can give you back the lives lost, the pain suffered, 
the years of internal torment and anguish. What was done cannot be undone, but we can end the silence. We can stop turning our heads away. We can look you in the eyes and finally say, on behalf of the American people, what the United States government did was shameful, and I am sorry. That's powerful. But the president said more. He extended it and said, the American people are sorry for the loss, for the years of hurt. You did nothing wrong, but you were grievously wronged. I apologize and I am sorry that this apology has been so long in coming. Then he extended that apology and said, to Macon County, to Tuskegee, to the doctors who have been wrongfully associated with the events there, you have our apology as well. And then he extended it further and said, to our African American citizens, I am sorry that your federal government orchestrated a study so clearly racial that I can never, that, that can never be allowed to happen again. It is against everything our country stands for and what we must stand against is what it was. As I sat there in the East Room and listened to the president, then I heard him say something else in that apology, I heard President Clinton also said something about your speaker, Fred Gray. And let me tell you what the president said, and I'm quoting him. A great friend of freedom, Fred Gray, thank you for fighting this long battle for these many years. I appreciate the president acknowledging me. At the time he did that and made the apologies, I had been working for those men for 25 years. Today I have been working for those men for 48 years and I'm still working for them. I promise those men, all of whom are now dead, that we would establish a museum in their honor so that the world would know that they made a contribution to the health care in their country. And I want you to know today, we have done so. And there is a history museum in Tuskegee that acknowledged what these men did. And we invite you to visit that museum. I think we we'll even have a picture here where you can see it. it was an old bank and they gave it and it has been converted and it educates Native Americans, Americans of European descent, Americans of African descent on the contributions they have made and it also serves as a permanent memorial for those men in the study. We ask you to visit it and support it and thank your organization for what it is doing for it. So I have a genuine interest in, a, in affordable health care for all. The disparity which now ex which the president found to exist in the Tuskegee syphilis study, now exists in healthcare in this country, and it should end. The men I represented in the syphilis study, and most of the clients I have represented over the last 66 years of law practice, did not have affordable healthcare. It is particularly noteworthy 
that this organization, your organization, is discussing this matter today at your annual meeting, open at your annual meeting and doing this opening session. You are to be commended for discussing it. But you've done more than that. This session is one of the action items that your organization has taken and that it communicated to you as its members earlier this year. If you didn't get a chance to read it, let me share with you a little bit about what your organization said it was going to do about this very topic that we are talking about. And this is what it says. At our core, BMES is a community of biomedical engineers who work toward improving health care. We have seen the health disparity data, which shows that black Americans are more likely to have major chronic health problems, coupled with a lack of access to quality health care. Much of the current clinical and research studies primarily benefit white patients. In addition to better addressing racial disparities in clinical studies, we also need to address the cost of the preventive and diagnostic tools that we develop as biomedical bi engineers to improve equitable access to health care. We also need to make our profession a place in which a diverse community can be comfortable and thrive. Then your organization went ahead to make a pledge, and let me share with you what your organization pledged to do. One, present scientific programming at our annual meeting on health care disparity and discrimination in access to health care. And that's what this session is all about. Two, convene dedicated conference sessions and seminars led by renowned subject matter experts to promote and foster discussions focused on bringing to light the conscious and subconscious biases which disproportionately affects the black community. We will partner with EMBA and other interested associations committed to a long term effort to build finding, findings into policy-driven actions. To build findings into policy-driven action. And then you said, reinvest in educating ourselves and our stakeholders in the BME community relieving the burden on the black co on our black colleagues who are too often the only resource to educate non-black indigenous and people of color so then the president has spoken your organization has spoken now i want to call your attention to one other organization i want to expand it and let you know what the National Urban League said. On a larger scale, the National Urban League makes an annual report on the state of black Americans. In that report, the Urban League states that the equity index can be interpreted as a relative status of black and whites in American society measured according to five areas. One, economic. Two, health. Three, education. Four, social justice. Five, civil engagement. In each, there is substantial disparity having a negative effect on African Americans as compared to white Americans. The report also states 
that African Americans are twice as likely as whites to be unemployed, three times more likely than whites to live in poverty, and more than 16 times as likely as whites to be incarcerated. I think your organization understands that this nation faces a problem of health care disparity and racial injustice. You have adopted a plan of action and you are beginning to implement that plan. Now let me give you some of my opinions. In my opinion, this country faces two major problems which has existed since the first African Americans were brought here as slaves in 1608. Those two problems are racial inequality, uh, are racism and inequality. The question then before us, as we have this annual meeting today, where do we go from here? So that we may have an impact not only in your place of employment, but in the place where you live and work. I want to suggest four things that you may want to consider. One, recognize racism and inequality is alive and well, and it is wrong. That declaration needs to come from the top, the White House, the Congress, the United States Supreme Court. If the heads of our institutions of higher learning and if the heads of our federal government, our cities, our counties, our professional organizations will come out with a loud voice saying that racism and equality are wrong, that's the first step. Second, devise a plan by which racism and inequality can be eradicated. I don't say that I stand here today and tell you what to do. But what I do say, and I don't stand here to tell you that I know all the things that needs to be done to eliminate racism and inequality. But I know this country and the people in this country and the leaders have brains and intellectual resources so that they can find answers. Young people, old people, middle-aged people, people of all races, with a concerted effort can do away with racism if we have a will to do so and devise a plan for it. When we had the problems with buses in Montgomery some 65 years ago, we came up with a plan and that plan was to have the Montgomery bus boycott which started the Civil Rights Movement. If we were able to do that for buses, we are able in this country to carry people to the moon and outer space. We are fighting a war for human and civil rights and against terrorism around the world. We are able to do all these things and yet we are unable to do away with racism and inequality in our own communities. We can if we will. The third thing we must do, a plan is no good unless you do what? You must execute it. So you must execute the plan. And then fourth, and this gets to be personal for each one of us, each one of us must do our individual part to eradicate racism and inequality. All of us want racism to be over. All of us would like to see inequality over, but we want somebody else to do it. But if it's going to happen, each one of us individually must do a part of it. I am sure, and I hope, that something I have said to you today will encourage you not only to make a determination to do these things with respect to racism 
and inequality, but will also assist you in realizing the importance of diversity. In case you need a little help in determining whether or not uh, diversity exists where you are, I suggest that you look around in your homes, your place of worship, your place of employment, your cities, fraternities, sororities, professional organization. If everybody there look like you racially, guess what? You may have a serious problem, a question of lack of diversity. My final message to you today, each of you is a leader in your community. You must be willing to give something back to your communities. You must be willing to contribute to and support worthy causes. You must show that to whom much is given, much is required. You need to take time to pass the torch of the mantle to the younger generation so that these young men and women will be able to face the challenges before them. And that's what you are doing here today. The challenges include racism, inequality, and economic and political disenfranchisement, and human indignities in public schools, the corporate and business world, and individual neighborhoods. You must seek to instill in these young people that they have a life worth living and that their dreams too can come true. And remember that all lives matters, including black lives. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, we will take questions. Um, we have one question from Matt Vasher. He says, I am inspired by your lifetime commitment to racial justice through the field of law as biomedical engineers. How should we make a lifetime commitment to eliminating healthcare disparities? Well, I think if you will follow what I have just talked to you about, I believe I have answered that question. It says, tell me one, that you're inspired by your life. I appreciate that. As a biometric engineers, how should we make a lifetime commitment? I think your organization has set the pattern for you. I think it recognized in the communication that it sent out earlier, and that's why I included it in my speech. Uh, it included the fact that you need to acknowledge these things exist. You need to hold seminars on it, and you're doing that now. You need to work with other organizations. I think by all of these things, you'll be able to do it. But let me tell you, what I usually tell people, and I'm almost 90 years old, I said, when I was a teenager in Montgomery and saw the problems we were having on the buses, nobody told me what to do. I saw the problem. I saw that African Americans were being mistreated not only on the buses but on other things. And I didn't know anything about lawyers, didn't know any, but they told me that lawyers help people. So I made a commitment while I was a teenager that I was going to become a lawyer. And I kept, uh, I, I, and I was going to not even apply to the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't admit me. Uh, finish law school, come back, take the Alabama bar exam, become a lawyer, and destroy everything segregated I could find. But still, I was a teenager and I decided that. The best thing about it, I didn't tell anybody about all of it because if I had, I never would have done it. So what I'm saying to you, don't ask me how to eliminate it. You see the problem, you recognize the problem, 
use all of the knowledge and experience you have and come up with some problems, talk to other people about it, and go and solve it. All right, next question. What is your recommendation for speaking with people who stubbornly insist that racism is no longer an issue? How can we open their eyes to the issues that don't directly affect them? By Natalie Weiss. Well, I think people have to have to recognize if, if, if we live in this country and seeing the problems that we have and the disparity and particularly seeing all the demonstrations that has happened relatively recently and the lives that's been lost and the demonstrations across the country for people who never been involved in any civil rights activities, I think you see there is a great need to solve the problems. And I think organizations like this and other organizations need to talk about it, come up with a plan, and just get out and do it. But we have to first, and I think one of the uh, good things about these demonstrations that's going on is the fact that so many people now realize who did not realize before that we had a problem. Because as long as you don't consider that you have a problem, you'll never solve it. Thank you. Um, from Walt Baxter, how has the novel coronavirus exposed many of these healthcare disparities and how do we attack these problems? Well, you know, I don't know anything at all about the virus. And I don't know anything at all about biometrics. And I don't know anything at all about engineering. But I think we all have seen in this country something that we've never seen before. For whatever reason, the virus came. And wherever it has come from, it has had a tremendous effect, not only on this country, but on the whole world. So we know we have a problem. How are we going to solve it? I think those of you who have greater knowledge than I have, and at 90 years of age, I don't need to be trying to tell you what to do. All I can tell you is what we did and if we can, if, if you can look at some of the things, and we don't mind sharing with you what we did to try to solve the problems, and if you can find some of the things we did will help you in solving this problem with the virus and any other problem of health care and inequality, then we'll be happy to do it. But all of us are going to have to work on it and not depend on somebody else to come up with a complete answer because your answer to the problem may be just as good as anybody else's. Thank you. Um, Don Elliott asks, can you share a little bit about John Lewis? John Lewis, mm -hmm. share, share about John Lewis. What? John Lewis. Oh, let me tell you a little something about John Lewis. I met John Lewis in 1958, shortly after the Montgomery bus boycott. And that was before Dr. King left Montgomery. He, uh, uh, Dr. King called me and says, Fred, and I'd represented him now ever since uh, the bus boycott. He said, I got a, a letter from a boy in Troy named John Lewis. Uh, he lives down there near Troy State in the same county where Troy State is, and he wants to go to Troy State. But Troy State is a state college only for whites, and nothing in 58 in Alabama, no educational institution or higher one of state uh, was uh, integrated, and he wanted to go. He says since he wants to go, and I think we would seriously consider it. I sent him a bus ticket. I want you to go to the bus station and meet him, bring him to me. 
I'll be at Reverend Abernathy's church, First Baptist Church, and uh, we'll talk to him and see if you won't be able to represent him in going to Troy State. I did what Dr. King suggested that I do. Met John Lewis, fine young man, only about 17 at the time, I believe. And I took him to the church and he discussed what he wanted to do. And we listened. And they were willing to have me file for him a lawsuit, but he was a minor. So in order to file the lawsuit, it had to be filed by his parents on his behalf. And uh, he said, well, I'll go back and talk to my parents about it. And uh, he left and went back to Troy. And he got back in touch with Dr. King a little later on and said, well, Dr. King, I'm sorry that uh, my parents feel that they got to live with these white people down here in Troy. And it would be too much pressure on them if they were to file a lawsuit to integrate Troy State. While John never filed a lawsuit, and I never had the opportunity to file a lawsuit for him, he had the nerve, and it was in his blood to do something. He and some of his other students had already applied for, we later found out, the library in Troy, and the, they wouldn't let the black kids in. But he went up to Nashville to the American Seminar and Fisk University and became involved in the civil rights movement. I did represent him later, however, when he came and led a delegation to Montgomery in 1960, the Freedom Rides, and they beat him back. I filed a lawsuit in his name, Lewis versus Greyhound Corporation, and we got that problem straight. A few years later, he led a group, Selvin to Montgomery March, and they beat him back on Bloody Sunday, and they called me, and I went to Selma, and before less than 24 hours, I filed a lawsuit on behalf of John Lewis and Jose Williams and the others, uh, which resulted in them going from Selma to Montgomery, and not only that, but resulted in the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So he was a great person. And then I continued to represent him over the years. And then a few days before his death, I received a call from him. And uh, his chief of staff told me that the representative wanted to talk to me. And on July the 8th, I talked with him about a week beforehand. And we ended up and we talked about how we, what all he had done. And I asked him, well, what do you want us to do? He said, brother, keep going. Keep pushing. Set the record straight. We had a prayer. And a few years, days later, he was dead. John Lewis was one of the greatest Americans this country has produced. And... We, I promised him that I would continue, keep going, I would keep pushing, and I would keep the record straight. He was a great man. Thank you. Um, we have many questions left. I don't think we have time to get to them all. On behalf of BMES, thank you so much for this excellent talk. And I think we will keep those words of John. Let me just say one final thing. Thank you for inviting me. Come to Tuskegee to, to see us and support the Multicultural Center for the Men in the Study. Thank you. Thank you. And just to keep those words alive, keep going, keep pushing, and set the record straight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.